Hello, friends. I'm David Prizendans, pastor of United Church of Painted Post, New York. Welcome to our online worship for April 26th, the third Sunday of the Easter season. Our scripture lesson is 1 Peter verse, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you in, and even though, um, I'll, I'll, forgive me friends, although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. How do we keep faith when things go bad? That's the question that Peter wrote this short letter to answer. Maybe we can ask the question in a different way. What does our faith, our Christian faith, say to us in the midst of all the troubles of this world, especially in the midst of this deadly pandemic? These questions and the resounding answer that Peter gives are every bit as important for us today as they were for Christians 2,000 years ago. How do we keep faith when things go bad? Peter's whole letter answers that question, but the first chapter is the rallying cry, the opening hymn, the first crash of the cymbals that announces the good news that is to come. How do we keep faith in adversity? By living in hope. That's how. God has given us a living hope an inheritance more precious than gold, imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. These glorious words are even more powerful because they were written to Gentile Christians far away from Israel. The earliest letters in the New Testament were written to the Jews of the Diaspora. They were scattered all across the Mediterranean basin, but they had roots in the Holy Land. But Peter's letter is addressed to newly converted Gentiles in Asia Minor. That's what is now Turkey. Their inheritance is not the history of Abraham and Sarah or Moses in the Promised Land. Their inheritance is a brand new story. An inheritance, as you certainly know, can either be a welcome gift or a heavy burden, and sometimes it's some of both. Its true value is determined by how we receive it. Something passed down from grandmother may be indeed more precious than gold to her, but if it's an unwanted gift, it may wind up in the attic or on eBay. But for people in the ancient world, inheritance did not mean grandma's Hummel collection. Inheritance determined your whole life, your worth and your standing, your whole being, your name was part of your inheritance, along with the items that passed on from generation to generation. An inheritance was not taken lightly back then, and it wasn't left in the attic to collect dust. Neither was the faith of the early Gentile Christians. They received the gospel, new life in Jesus Christ, a gift for which they knew they were unworthy, a gift they were eager to share with others. They were even more eager to share it because they lived with hostility all around them, and their inheritance gave them a new way of being, a new life, a new hope. Rarely, if ever, do we encounter hostility because of our faith. Christianity for centuries has been our dominant cultural institution. It's been just the color of the wallpaper in the United States. That has both a good side and a bad side, of course. The bad side is that the Christian faith has been blunted, 
watered down. It's lost its dangerous edge. God has often been appropriated as a kind of magic blessing machine in the sky. The worst side of this is when a political party or a candidate says, God is on our side, and if you oppose us, you oppose God. And we hear that in our country these days. I once heard the story of a pastor who was asked to offer prayer in the locker room of a major league baseball team just before the first game of the World Series. The coach asked the clergyman to pray that their team would win. The pastor replied, I prayed every day for 15 years that my wife would get better, and she never did. What I'm going to pray for now is that every man on this team plays his best and gives God the glory for it. The story I heard never said which team won, but it doesn't matter because God won that day. Even though Christianity in the United States has been domesticated or made the private property of politicians, we can still look back and learn from the zeal of the first Christians, the first pilgrims in this country, whose faith enabled them to overcome incredible obstacles in making the new world their home. We can learn from the faith of African Americans held in slavery who faced unbelievable violence and oppression, the like of which we can't even imagine, but who found and claimed their inheritance in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can remember the first women preachers who knew that God had called them to preach despite the opposition they met. There are countless examples in our country and across our whole world of faith growing stronger in the face of adversity. The Christian church in China and in Africa has thrived despite all attempts to subdue or even to destroy it. But not everyone responds to adversity in a way that allows them to grow. We all know people who have buckled under stress or who have become bitter or hopeless. Most of us have been there at one time or another. I certainly have. Some of us are there right now, weighed down to the breaking point or beyond by the weight of our grief or illness or our isolation and fear in the midst of this pandemic. Peter's letter gives courage and shores up the faith of those of us in danger of losing it. And at the very same time, it serves as a rallying cry to those who are strong in our faith. We live in community, the weak and the strong together the hopeful and the hurting together. These are all present in our church right here today, just as they're present within ourselves. So how do we keep faith when things go bad? By remembering and reminding each other that the core of the Christian faith is hope. Christ's victory over death brings us new life, new life that will come fully in the future but also new life that breaks into our present right now, that transforms and redeems our sin and our pain. Hope is God's promise of future breaking into and transforming our present. So be of good faith, my friends, in all our adversities. Others have walked this road before us, and the great cloud of witnesses walks with us even now when we feel we are walking alone. We are not alone. We are surrounded by love. Christ has won the victory, and God's new world is breaking into our world. May we open our hearts enough this morning and this week to let God's new world find a home within us to take root and to grow. And may we open our lives this morning and this week that we may share this incomparable blessing with others. God says to you and to me and to our whole world today, be not afraid. Please pray with me. Gracious God, Teach us to be not afraid in the midst of this scary world. Open our eyes to your new life breaking into our world. And break open our lives, great God. May your light shine in us 
and your and may your light shine through us that as you have blessed us others may be blessed as well glory and power to you lord christ bless and heal this hurting world and forgive us of our sins in the name of christ our savior we pray amen